Um, that, that means for today that we are going to cover two topics. The first one is still introductory. This one, what is human-computer interaction, and the second one is instead uh, starting to speak about uh, the need-finding phase and specifically the need-finding methods that exist and that we are going to, to use. Uh, you are going to use mostly. Uh, and we will start today and then we will complete uh, next week the speaking about need-finding. But before that, uh, I need to, to give you a clarification and uh, a thing that I s forgot last time uh, that is um, practical matter, nothing really strange. So the clarification is, came from a, um, a question that I received on Telegram uh, privately a few days ago um, about the exam dates. And so uh, when I said that groups can choose which exam date uh, to, to use for giving the exams, I did not meant that groups can freely choose any day of the year, whenever it is to give the exam, but that among the dates available from the Politecnico, among the, the regular, the official exam date, groups can choose when to give the exams, first session, second session, etc. And so this work, as in every other course, you decide wh when to give the exam and how many time you want to give the exam. You have four sessions plus one extraordinary. So you can choose as a group in which one of these you want to give the exam, but not deciding a random day in the year to give the exam. And according to that date, one week before, you will have to submit everything. But the dates are decided by the university. Not by you, not by me, for sure. So we, we get the date that we, we get. Okay, that was the first thing. The second thing is actually a rule of thumb uh, that is particularly useful uh, when you write to, to me, let's say, or to the other teachers or during the lab hours. Uh, that is a, a rule of thumb about language. So the course is in English. I'm trying to speak English in the lectures. All the material will be in English. The exam will be in English, etc. In the lab, uh, the teaching assistant uh, will be all Italians, like me. And in the labs, if the group is made by people that understand and speak Italian, if you want, you can speak Italian. Also, if you write to me, you can write in Italian, and I can reply in Italian. But if in the group or in the conversation there is a one person, that, at least one person, that doesn't, doesn't understand Italian, the language is English. Okay, so if you are in a group with all Italians speaking with me, choose the language you prefer between English and Italian. If you are in a group where at least one person does not speak Italian, speak in English or write in English, and I will reply in the same language. Just a rule of thumb, uh, because I, I have received some emails by Italian people in English. And I replied in English, but maybe it's easier for, for everybody if we speak, um, if we can, if we speak in a native language. If we cannot, we will revert to, to English as, as a second choice. And these are the two uh, things that I would like to to tell you, there is any questions about the course so far, or life in general? I don't know if I have the answer, but you can ask. No? I don't know if it's good, but it's fine. Um, so. First topic of the day, then we will have a break, and after the break we will see the, the results of the pool on Telegram for shifting, for changing the, the second slot, with the topic of the second slot with the third and vice versa. Uh, but now let's speak about 
what is HCI. So what we are going to cover in this class is an introduction, still an introduction, not to the course, but to the field. And in particular, we will see what is HCI. That is the reason why we are here. Um, we will get in some mindset already that will be useful for the rest of the course and for the project. And we will speak about usability. That is uh, a critical concept in all of this. We will also have a little bit of overview of the interaction design processes or the design processes in general. And we will see a few of them very quickly just to let you know that they exist and they are different and with pros and cons. And we don't follow basically strictly any of them in this course. And then we will speak about a little bit of what we mean with the human-centered design process that instead we are going to follow in the course. So what is HCI? Mm -hmm. So we know that HCI means human-computer interaction. Um, we know that probably it's a mix of concept. If you see in these slides, there are actually a lot of words. Um, let's start from the first gray ball, devices. And so human group interaction has also to do with devices. Devices are the one that we are going to use or we use to get information or to input things into a computer system. And Devices are very different and require different user interface, different rules. So for instance, um, which are these, well, I can ask you instead of speaking, which are three devices, two devices that came to your mind for human-computer interaction? Uh, are physical devices. Okay, too many. One at a time. Yes. A mobile phone, mm, more or less. I will specify better. At other? A wearable. Others? Ah? Easier, easier. A display, better. It's not really interactive per se. When made touch screen, it becomes interactive. Another one that is on, repeat, a calculator. No? Easier, easier. It has the name of an animal. The mouse, it's a device that you, uh, or the trackpad, that's the same concept. The keyboard, all of these are devices. The wearable and the smartphone are more complex devices that are made by different of these smaller devices. And all of these impact the user interface and interactive system. Um, which is to you, I, I don't have the, the right, the precise answer, but in general term, you can, we can reason it. Uh, if you use a mouse only or keyboard plus mouse user interface, can you be or a touch screen? Hmm? Choices, mouse versus touch screen. For an interface, which one is more precise in the selection of the element? A mouse. Hmm? You can reach not a pixel, um, precision, but closely. A touch screen is less precise because your finger is bigger than the miser pointer. And so the user interface change, change significantly because you cannot have a small button with a touch screen because you cannot press it. Or you press that button and all the others that are around it. So that is part of the use of human computer action how devices impact the user interface. So they don't work in a vacuum. They are interconnected. And also human group interaction is focused on the creation of new devices sometimes. More in research efforts, but it is. 
um, so this builds interactive system user interface and are something that we care about because actually as I, it has an impact on the kind of user interface that you are creating. Um, next, performance error ergonomics and human factor. Are things, well, performance error a little bit, but ergonomics and human factors are things that we are not going to cover in this course. What is ergonomics, do you know? It's a, it's, it's a fine definition, it's a right definition. N not maybe right, precise, but it's enough. Uh, it's a science, uh, a subfield of engineering, actually, um, that pertain to mechanical engineering, mostly, um, that st they study how the, um, I'd say, the, how the, the mechanical parts, the seats, the table, the desk, can improve in comfort, usability, efficacy, etc. And an example of ergonomy in your probably life, something that you can change to improve the ergonomy. Not here, clearly. Not in this room, but in a, outside of, the, of here. To grasp, that could be, yes, but it, there is something not technology related. The chairs have been a proper desk, but there is another one that you, the what? The pen. Ah, the bed. Maybe. It's not really mechanical moving. It's something that you, you can move. And you can, you can also drive the, the things that is outside, that contains them. A what again? Ah? I didn't hear. What do you drive or you can drive? A car. What is inside the car that you can change? The position? The seats. The seats are uh, a great example of ergonomics. Again, it's something more close to mechanical because you change the inclination, the position. In some fancy, expensive cars, you can also change a part of it to be more comfortable, but also to increase performance and decrease errors. Mm? So ergonomics and human factor has more to do with how we perceive the body and how we perform in some positions, physical positions, in an environment. And we are not going to, to cover that part in this course. But just to keep in mind that they, it exists and it still is related with human-computer interaction at large. And then here in the bottom, you see three laser pointer, three dots. Well, one is human-computer interaction that we are going to, we are trying to define today. Uh, that means humans, let me say in this moment, interacting with a computer. So the two ends of these the two sides of these are humans and computers. Uh, in some field, also related to computing, this is mostly called the human-machine interaction. So if you speak with people that do robotics, they probably use human-machine interaction, not human-computer interaction, or automatic system, mm -hmm. automatic control. Uh, why? What is the difference to you? Why machine versus computer? What's the difference? Oh, no, yes, you can have the user interface. Yeah, because it's always interaction, so. Yes, computer is a more specific thing. Machine could be any machine. You can have zero electronic, zero inform computer science, but you have a lever that you have to press or to pull and it's still a machine. Hmm? Even if it's not electronic based, even if it's not computing based, it's still a machine. It, you have a user interface. So let's define user interface. What is a user interface to you? Your personal definition of what you mean for user interface. 
by example. Tell me some example user interface. The desktop environment, it's, yes, yeah, so let's say the, the desktop environment of computer is a graphical user interface. It's a user interface, it's fine. Then other examples. Windows still graphical user interface, yes. Some non-graphical user interface maybe? What? I don't hear, so. Buttons, physical buttons like the one that we don't have, like this one? Yes, these are a user interface. Not a computer system, to a machine, maybe, more or less, but it's a user interface, it's something that the person can use to do an action. In this case, turn on, I don't know what, what this does, that button, but something. A common line is still a graphical user interface of another kind, but yes, it's a common line user interface. Yes, controlling the cars are user interfaces for the car, the brakes, the lever, the buttons that you have in a car. And all of these are using your sight and using your hand. Something that doesn't involve your sight and your hands Yeah, the, the, the conversational agent like, um, let's say, Siri, et cetera, they, are, they have a user interface that is a vocal user interface, not a graphical, but it's a vocal user interface. All of these are user interface, things that allow a user doing something to accomplish a task or a goal, turn on the light, control the car, uh, using some windows to, inside a desktop environment, to write a text or read the slides. All these are something that interface with a person. Um, okay, and then there is, so machine is general. And so all of these are user interface. Human computer interaction is focused in those machines when there is a computer. So nowadays there is a computer almost everywhere, but still there are so when I press that button, that button is a user interface. There is not a computer behind that, I suppose. There is some electronic system, but it's not really uh, something that is a computer. Or um, a tractor, hmm? the, the old models don't, doesn't have computers or a lot of electronic in, on board. Still, they have a user interface. You control uh, a car or something similar. And then there is the old version of this term, that is wrong, and you should not use it, and nobody should use it, and nobody is going to use it. That is man-machine interaction, and it was replaced by human-machine interaction for evident reason um, in the name, but means the same things of HMI, human-machine interaction. So if you, for another example, if you go to speak with um, car makers, they use the term human-machine interaction, HMI. They have HMI department that are focused on ergonomics also, because seats in a car, etc. Hmm? And in all of this, something that we are going to speak and use during the course is clearly a design methods, or better, a design process that is centered on people. Hmm? Because Ultimately, as I said to you three minutes ago, it's an interface, all of these can be an interface between a person and a computer. So it should be not only thinking about the computer, but we should also think about the person. That is the lead motif of all of this, actually. So what is in brief human-computer interaction as a field? Uh, before going into the slides, let's have a look at the pictures. Do you know what are they? First one, the colored one. Do you know what it is? You may be never seen that in that form, but you use it. It's a mouse. Yes, it's the first mouse. It's the first prototype mouse that was made. That is 
uh, available in, um, in the Computer Museum of Mountain View in California. They have the, these and other models of this kind of mouses. And the mouse was created, let's say, in, in the human computer interaction field, because it's a way, it's a device to interact with the computer. Hmm? Uh, before the mouse, there was nothing. And that was for, it was a keyboard, clearly. And that was a research object that after several, several years came to market as the mouse that we are still using today. Um, and the presentation of this mouse with all the system that is around it um, is, was made in, by, uh, in a talk that is cu currently still uh, called uh, um, the mother of all demos. So when, when somebody wants to refer how to do a, a great demo, the first thing that typically you find is look at that. When the mouse and on the system was presented, and this is informally called the mother of all demos, the mouse presentation. The other one, the other one is, uh, is harder. But what resembled to you? If you have to say, I have seen something similar today, today in these years, what do you think could be the similar thing that you can have? Uh, yeah, there is a keyboard, but there is also that large square. A blueberry? It's a blackberry. Blueberry, you eat a blueberry. <laughs> no, no, it's not. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a remember, yeah, because they have the keyboard. But something more, let's say, this century. <laughs> this is something quite old, but what is something? This is, uh, yes, it's quite, quite old. What is something that you use today? Some of you have on the desk. It's like a tablet, yes, like an iPad. That is called the Dynabook. It was invented by Alan Kay at Xerox Park in the 50s, 60s. And it's considered the ancestor of current tablets. Alan Kay, just to give you, to, to let you know who he is, is the one that was in the group that invented the object-oriented programming as a paradigm. So they created the first object-oriented programming language at Xerox Park. And they also focus on this as a tool for learning computing for children. And you have to think that computers back then weren't like this one that we have, were bigger, more costly, bulk. So that was really something that was innovative for that time. And also that is came, coming out from the, uh, let's say, your search in human-computer interaction. In this case, are two devices, physical, but clearly the, the Dynabook also has uh, a software inside that should be usable with the keyboard in that time. Because they were limited, let's say, by the technology that they had. But they still did all of this to improve uh, human capabilities. Uh, in the first case, more in a performance, work-oriented. In the second case, for learning and children. But still, they had a goal. So outside of the picture, what is human-computer interaction as a field? It is, first of all, as you, as you can imagine, a multidisciplinary field. It includes Computing, it includes electronics, it includes psychology, because people, hmm, computer scientists or engineers in general are not the best people to, to speak when you have a people problem, typically. So you get the involvement of psychology. Uh, and originally, the bulk of the, of the field was actually psychology and computer, uh, computer science, then was extended to other disciplines, sociology, lawyer, 
etc., for ethical problem, for multi-people environment. So not just one person interacting with a computer, but groups of people interacting with one computer, etc. And as a field, so first of all, is multidisciplinary. And that means that many of the techniques that we have in the field came from different areas, came from different perspectives, and are found in that, also in those fields, individual field. And some of them are also are shared between subfield of computing. So for instance, the empirical software engineering parts, that is software engineering, but it's empirical, uh, shared a lot of methods with human computer interaction. They do things slightly, they, they tell things slightly different than we do, but the methods are the same. And all of them came from other fields, originally. So it's multidisciplinary, and the goal of the field is the design, the evaluation, and implementation of interacting computer system for human use. And we find, again, design and evaluation and implementation that are three of the things that we mentioned last time. We want to design a system, then, uh, iter then prototype it, evaluate it, and iterate. And clearly, human interaction also studied the major phenomena surrounding the design, the evaluation, and the implementation of such systems. As I said, it involves two entities, people and a computer, that are interacting, meaning they determine each other behavior over time. So it's not a folkloristic notion of interaction, like two entities speaking, but it's framed in terms of the person as a goal that want to reach using a computer, and that goal in the, is then uh, transformed in one or more task to be done. Which is the difference between goal and task? It's the same thing? You have a goal, you have a task, are the same things? So it's binary answer, yes, no. No, good. And which is the difference? Goal is the ultimate things, right? Yes, and task, sorry. Tasks are the small or not so small, depends, things that you do to reach your goal. So let's frame it in something that you all know. Uh, you want to enroll to an exam, and that's your goal. You want to enroll in the exam. How do you enroll in the exam? is the task. The answer to that question is the task. So the goal is, I want to, very simple goal, not a very ambitious goal, is I want to enroll in the human computer interaction exam, which are the tasks that I need to do on the Polytechnic website to enroll to an exam. Well, open the web page, log in, um, click somewhere, then select the course, then click somewhere, etc and then receive a message, say, I don't know if you receive a message, but let's say that you receive a message, say, uh, enrollment complete, or you are enrolled to this course, or whatever. All of these are small tasks that allow you to complete your goal. Hmm? And we will frame, especially for need finding, and especially for synthesizing uh, the outcomes, things in this way. We have goal, we have task. And all the interaction is about goal and task. Uh, this is a repetition sort of more specific about the multidisciplinarity of HCI. Clearly we will focus on the computing aspects more, mostly, uh, but actually there are so many other disciplines that intersect and this discipline are more and more every year. And so there is psychology, ergonomics, so mechanical engineering, sociology, business. There is also business economic needs. If something works, probably is also profitable and the company can continue, etc. Uh, graphic design, how things look, not only how things work, so also how 
do you use colors, etc. Um, technical writing, help guides, documentation, uh, translation between a language and the others, it's all part that is clearly uh, related to this. And this multidisciplinary actually helped us in getting expertise from different domains and enriching the methods that we have in terms of design methods and processes, models, guidelines, best practice, convention, how we conduct experiment in a way that is safe and is not introducing biases in the action that we do. What is biases? What is a bias? Do you know what is a bias without looking on the dictionary? Okay, again, it's a binary answer, yes or no. Do you know what is a bias? B-I-A-S? If something is not objective, yes, so everything else, not really, but yeah, if something is not objective in a way, we always introduce bias in what we do. I also, I am biasing you in this moment probably, giving my interpretation of all this. If you have another teacher with the same slides, probably you will hear something slightly different, not grammatically different, but slightly different, probably yes, something more, something less, I'm bringing my expertise, my opinions with me, like everybody else. And this is bias. We can try to be objective, but we have our background, our experience that bias other people in everyday interaction. So when it's in everyday interaction and it's not done with malice, it's fine, probably. Uh, but when you want maybe to study a specific phenomena and you start directing people in one direction or another, then you are faking the results. You are, you are influencing the results of the phenomena you are studying. If you want to understand if it's better a blue button or a gray button or a green button on the same interface, on the same web interface, and you, all your questions, all your action is to prefer the green button, maybe you speak more about the green button or you present more uh, limitation on the other button. Look at the color. Isn't it bad, this blue? The green is better, no? All of these can create biases. It's very simple as an example. But it can create bias on the other person that at the end they can say, oh yes, green is better. Even if it's not. So you are introducing biases in the process. So we need to understand how to, we, we, we need to understand and we have methods to minimize these biases. Uh, by another kind of bias, for instance, in, in experiment, you in experiment have, um, you want to evaluate an interface, that is something that is, we will see. Uh, an evaluation typically happens by task. You give the person to do something on you, one or more interface. And what we typically do is, not presenting the task in the same order for everybody. So one person will do task one, two, three, and the other person will do task three, two, one. And the other one will, will do task two, one, three. This is to reduce any bias that the knowledge of how it works, the system will influence the outcome of the task that is after. If everybody as the third task is the end, everybody know how it works by two tasks that are before, and the results of the third task, you cannot say that is independent from the previous two. You cannot say, maybe, maybe it is, maybe it's not, but you cannot say. So we will see also methods to minimize these biases. So the goal of HCI, well, clearly it has two ingredients, users, one or more user, and one or more computer. 
and the other ingredients is the task or the tasks that the person or the people want to accomplish with the computer system. And the ultimate goal of all of these is that the computing system must support the user task, is built in a way that is support the user task, with a focus on usability. That we will see the definition of usability, that there is, the, there is still a standard definition, that is an ISO definition, and a more operative definition. But right now, we'll let, let's keep in mind these three use word. Hmm? A good system, a usable system, should, well, a usable system should be usable, not, but a good system, a good interactive system, should be useful, usable, and used. If you are missing, especially if you are presenting these to the others, like in a company, hmm? or a mobile application on a store, if you have a useful system that is not usable and is not used, actually, in the end, is useless. Maybe the system per se is useful, but if nobody uses it, what's the scope? Similarly, if it's usable but not useful, maybe it's nice for a game, for a few things, but then people will stop use it. And if it's used but not useful and usable, as soon as you have a better system that is more usable than, than yours, people will shift to the new system, even if it's used, even if it's widely used. So we will try to keep in mind this three goal, to create things that are useful, clearly, not useless, usable, and ultimately, we hope, used. So let's, give, let's go a little bit more in the ingredients, quickly on the computer and the humans. But uh, we will see after, in, towards mid-course, uh, more things about the humans. But Let's start from the computer. Computers are traditionally split from an interaction perspective in two parts, inputs and outputs. Mm? And you all know well both parts, no? Uh, the human doesn't use the same term, inputs and outputs, but also, the pers also people have inputs and outputs, in a way. Mm? So the sensory systems are our outputs. Sorry, our inputs. Hmm? We perceive the world with our sight, with our eyes. We get some input in a visual system, and then we do something. Hmm? We hear something, we touch something, and we, and we react. If you have something that is really hot here on the table, and you came here and touch it, what happens? What happens automatically for you? You have something very, very hot here, and you, you don't know, and you touch it. What do you do? You, yeah, you remove your hand. You don't stay there, oh, yes, it's hot, I'm, I'm burning myself. You remove your hand. And it's automatically, because you receive, an out, you receive an input that is, it's hot. And the action that your body does after a, process that is cognitive, it's to remove it, not to harm yourself. So we have the sensory system visual, uh, auditory, optical, and spatial, which is the one that we use more. We don't use all of them at the same mo this way. There is one of these sensory systems that we use a lot in our life, more than the other three. Visual. The visual system is the system that we use more. It's not the more efficient, but it's the one that we use more. And the second one is auditory. And then optic. But the most system that we use is visual. And that's why all our systems are, when we spoke about give me example of user interface, the first thing that you say were graphical user interface, because they are visual. Uh, then we have the acting system, the voice, the hands, the head, the body, the muscle, etc. And we have cognitive process in all of these. Perception, 
So something that transforms the input in something that, that makes sense for us, the memory to remember things, etc. And we are missing the third ingredient, that is the task. Uh, so before going to, to the task, just one more thing about interaction. Uh, in uh, 2017, um, these two people here that, were, that are from Northern Europe uh, tried to define what the interaction is in human-computer interaction. And they came with this table and uh, 11 pages paper, something like this, but this is the table that summarizes this. And say that interaction has different concept. It's contextualized as dialogue, one person speaking, dialoguing with a computer, it can be um, a tool use. So I'm interacting with a tool like I'm interacting with a screwdriver. It's not dialoguing, it's interacting. Um, or control, I want to control something very closely, etc. So all of these are possible definition of interaction here. If you want, there are examples, etc. for all of these. But again, to tell you, that is not a folkloristic term, that is one people interacting with another, but it has or deeper and specific concept or should be in any case um, interested with goal and pursuit as the metric and the action of interaction. Mm -hmm. That is the last, li the last line in this, um, in this slide. And the other thing that is interesting and we are going to see more on this in three seconds, is that the other sentence, it concerns two entities, human and computers, that and this is the, the most important part, that determine each other behavior over time. So human determine the behavior of computer and vice versa. Do you agree? No, more or less and we will see how they will determine each other's behavior. Uh, so let's start with, sort of, uh, with some assumptions, and then we can proceed. Uh, so some assumption uh, that we have in the rest of, the, of this presentation. The user, the person, wants to accomplish some goal. That's our assumption. Uh, and those goals are made in a specific, here it's called application domain or in a specific context. What means? Means that a person doing a goal through tasks can have, are influenced by the application domain that is specific and also by the context. Imagine that you have to do an application for doctors, for medical doctors, or you have to do an application for children or you have to do an application for people the same age of the doctors, but doing a totally de developers, video makers. The domain in which the application is, is clearly different. It has an impact on what you put in the application, what the application can do or should do, or when it can do, how, how many errors you are you accepting if it's something for a doctor in the surgical area, maybe that should be really zero errors, not introducing errors, not introducing noises. If it's something for a video maker, maybe some errors are acceptable. Not dramatic errors, but some errors can be acceptable. And think about language. Maybe in a, in a, not maybe, in a medical environment, there are specific terms that will be the doctor's nose and use it. And it's normal for them to use that. That it's clearly different from the term that you use, even for indicating the same thing. So there is, each domain has a specific jargon, term, set of possible processes already in place in which you are inserting yourself to complete the goal that the user wants. So the domain is, part of this equation. And the context is also part of this equation. Imagine that you want uh, to, 
create a, a game for smartphone. Or better, if you want to enroll to the, to the exam at the, for the Polytechnico, on the Polytechnico system. What are you going to use? The website or the mobile application? You have two choices. So already that is a choice. And if you have to enroll in the exam in a quiet room, on a computer, it's one thing. If you have to enroll in an exam, and this is a totally hypothetical uh, and absurd situation, in uh, a, a music center, hmm? it's with, or in the middle of a, of a party, that is not something that you do, I understand, but let's say that you really want to enroll to exam during a, a party with 100 people, uh, a concert, the context in which you are is dramatically different. The same task, the same action, the same interface, but where you are is changing your attention, for instance, because in one, si in one case you are silent and you are alone, in the other one there is a lot of other things that are happening and you probably would like to do other things and not stay there in front of a computer. And similar if you want to do it on a smartphone. If you do it on a smartphone outside with the sun, it's one thing. If you do that outside while it's raining heavily, it's totally another context in which you are. So context has also an impact on the same goal and the same user and the same interface. And this is the first assumption. The other assumption is that op tasks are operation that manipulate the concept of a domain so to reach a goal. Uh, and again, interaction studying the relation between the user and system. And a system, this is assumption, that is what we, we consider, that possess a state, a speak a language. That is a system language. And the person also has a state, also speak a language. That is his language or her language. And the state includes the understanding of the system state and the intention to perform the task. And all of this was simplified and put in picture by Donald Normal with this model of interaction in the 80, more or less. Uh, let's say that, try to depict that. On one side you have people, a person, and on the other side you have a system. And the system has an output and input system. And there are two arrows. One is the evaluation that go from the system to the user. So when the system does something, we immediately evaluate the state of the system. So if you, again, open the, your page on the, on the Portale della Didattica, you evaluate if that page is the right one or not according to the task that you had. And then if everything is fine, you will probably not notice and continue, but if the page is as, as, as wrongly out, as strangely out, you, you notice something, you want to do something different. And this is the evaluation. And on the other side, there is the execution. That is what the person wants to do with the system. So clicking somewhere, touching a button, opening a window, a browser window, for instance, etc. And the execution change the state of the system. If you click on a link, the state change because you have a new page open and you have to evaluate what you see in the page to understand minimum if it's something that you are interested in or not. And to decide what is the next step. I'm reading some documents, I found some link, I open the link, is interesting, yes, I can read it. If it's not interesting, I will close the tab. Our evaluation, what we see is influencing the next step of execution that then is, is influencing the evaluation, et cetera, in this loop. And Norman also specified better what is the steps that we do during the evaluation. Hmm? So first of all, we establish, and we do that, just immediately, we don't notice. First of all, we establish the goal what we want to do. We want to roll to the exam. Then we form the intention. How? 
we want to enroll to the exam. We want to do it on the mobile application, we want to do it on the website, etc. And from the intention, we specify which are the tasks, the sequence of actions that we want to do to accomplish the goal and to satisfy the intention. So, what do we decide? The website? Okay, so we open the browser, we type didattica.polito.it, we press login, we insert the username and password, we press the button, etc. All of these are tasks, small or big, that you want to see, and they specify the action sequ sequence that you do. And Norman say that you don't, not, not always you do the action, but before doing the action, you specify in your mind which are these actions, at least the first one. Okay, I need to op open the browser, open the browser. I need to type the address, type the address. I need to log in with username and password. Oh, I don't know what is my username and password. Let me check somewhere else. All these set of actions are actions that we specify in our mind and then we execute. And we execute in a millisecond. It's not something that took hours. Hmm? But we always do these steps. And on the other side, in the evaluation, we did three things. We perceive the system state we see the result. We interpret the system state. There is something that looks different. I perceive it, I interpret it as wrong or right, and then I evaluate the system state to proceed with the next step of execution or to stop it and say it's not working. Let's do other things. But if it's working and it's fulfilling our goal, we continue in this loop. And the distance between the user and the system in this process, is Norman called them gulf. We have a gulf of execution and a gulf of evaluation. A, 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 a usable system has smaller gulf of execution. A bad system has large goal for execution because it asks us more effort to establish the goal, to form an intention, to specify the action sequence, and then to re-specify the action sequence because it's wrong. And then the result is something that we don't understand, so we try again. We, d we see a strange error, we don't understand. So it's more cycle, it's more difference, more distance between the two parties. Uh, well, this is the same thing in the, the original normal diagram that you can find in, uh, in, in, in his book, but it's not uh, really important. Uh, and then, it's the concept in this case that's important. And then, other two people uh, create an extension of this model in which just they make explicit the user interface. It's exactly the same model as before, but they made explicit the user interface. Why? Because we work on the user interface mostly. Yes, there is a system that does things, but here we are interested in the interface between the user and the computer. So the fact that when you enroll to an exam, there will be a query in the database or multiple query in the database, an insert in that same database, etc., is something that is in the system, but is something that is not necessarily present on the user interface. On the user interface, you will see a button that say enroll here or whatever it is. And then what happens when you press the button is a system problem, is not a user interface problem. So they explicit that, but it's ex exactly the same. But they also add three uh, things explicitly. That the user speak the task language, the system speak the core language, and the user interface speaks the user interface language. And this aligning these three languages is where the problem are. Because the one that create a system or create a user interface not always speak the people language, not the idiom like Italian or English or French or whatever, but the terms, the choices of the sentences, the position of things is not what the person expect to have, but the system propose things. So you maybe have experience to be in a website or an application and don't know how to proceed. 
That is a mismatch between the, your task language, what you want to do, and the system language. And it's not a personal responsibility. It's not a user responsibility to fix the, his language or her language. It's the system, it's the user interface, specifically that should have a language closer to the task language, as much as closer as possible. A concrete example, if you see a user interface, a pop-up, a graphical user interface, that say there's two buttons, some text, uh, two buttons, one is close and the other one is cancel. What are you going to press? What's the difference between close and cancel? Imagine you have that, you have completed something success, successfully, let's say, and you have, congratulations, you have done, cancel, close. Randomly, you choose one or the other. What do you do? What do you click? Probably, but all of these, yes, I, I, I can agree. But all of these is, it's a mismatch between your language and the user interface language because if they mean different things like close, closing, and cancel, I am afraid that my submission will be canceled, it's a reason that you are doing. It's an assumption that you have in using the system. But it's not, we are the same, but you don't know. So you are saying, okay, if you press cancel, maybe it will break something, so probably close is better, but it's all reasoning that you ask every single person that is using your user interface to do. So if they are different, why don't you use different terms? Like, okay, done, or start again, if that is the goal, to cancel the submission and start again or delete the submission. It's more explicit, still two buttons, technically the same thing, the same user interface, two buttons, just the language is different. And instead, if they're the same things, why you have two? But here, you also see that the problem is that you are asking people to think, to understand if you have to press one button or the other to complete a procedure. So that is, a problem with language, a small problem. It's not uh, rocket science, but still it's something that we see every day, especially here. Um, and this model also split the evaluation and the execution step in four parts. Uh, articulation between user and the input, uh, performance between the input and the system, presentation, what the system present through the user interface, and observation, what the, per the person understand after observing the output that is seen. Hmm? So articulation are forming the goal and doing the task. The input, the performance is the task that is done on the system quickly, as quickly as possible, and vice versa. So let's speak for a moment about human errors. Uh, and there is a, a, a sign there that is in the next slide. So human errors, user errors, can happen in the Gulf of execution, mostly. And these errors can be of two type. So, and the solution is typically we need to change the system, not change the person. Uh, and there could be two kinds of errors. Uh, the one that we call sleep, and the one that we call mistake, the real errors. So the sleep is when a person formulated the right action, but doesn't do it right. I have to press that button, but I don't press the button. That's a sleep. I know that I have to press the button. I see the button, I'm just pressing another button. It's a mistake. So click the wrong icon or double click too slowly. So 
the system doesn't get the double click. I want to double click, but I just am slow, so I don't double click. Not a big deal. I don't double click in the right uh, on the right velocity. I will do it again, and the second time probably will get it. And some of these uh, can be corrected by a better interface, like if people click the same one button instead of the other, maybe they should be more spaced one for the other. Mm? So adding some space in the middle will prevent the error. Uh, layout, highlights, etc. Small error, not uh, problematic. Uh, they can happen due to the context of their domain. Again, if you are in the middle of great confusion and you have to do something, if the interface asks you to think about, oh, you have to press cancel or close, it's already a mess and you will probably make a mistake. If you're alone with years, nothing to do for the next hour, etc., you can probably spend more time and calm to do the right action immediately. Uh, the mistake instead is when you don't know the system well and you may not formulate your right goal or action. For instance, you see uh, this icon, the lens for zoom, and you want to do zoom, and you click on that, but that is about search. So the goal is I want to zoom in. You identify that that is the button to press, but it's not because it's for searching. So you, you, you know, you learn it, it but you, you have to do it again. In this case, we say the user mental model is not the same of the system mental model, the system state. So the model that I have of how a system should work is not the same how the system works. And I bet that you experiment this frequently, not with computer, but with doors. How many times you push a door that should be pulled, or vice versa? Never happened? No? You never push a door that needs to be pulled? All the times, yeah. That is a mismatch between your mental model, I have to push the door to enter, to go out, and the system, in this case the door, state. And also in this case is a problem that requires a redesign or additional training, not to open a door, but be a different way to set up the, the handles could have had. Uh, in computing system, a mistake require either to change the system, to change the user interface, or training, uh, because maybe you are in a situation in which you need people to change something. You cannot change the system too much. Uh, and this is especially true in high-risk systems. Again, medical systems, um, flights, pilots that fly, they should have a series of things that are mandatory. They cannot say, oh no, I don't, I don't understand this, I'm not learning. They will have training, they will have years and years of training to know how to fly a plane and how to use all the user interface that the plane has. So these are the two kinds of errors. And about the errors, uh, in any case, they are never the fault of the user, but they are the results of bad design. Not the slips, the slips can happen, but the mistakes. Because again, we tend to be, there is written imprecise, destructed, and not om omni omniscient. We can also say that we are a mess most of our time because life happens and we cannot always control everything. So the system design that should prevent the errors, not just intercept the error when it happens, but just prevent it as much as possible. So we need to design systems, again, that are suitable for humans. In this, considering that humans are not machines and makes mistakes and live with that. Um, now oh, here there is an example of articulation, and this is um, this is a smart home. 
that exist or existed in uh, Val d'Aosta. Um, and so you can do, it's everything controlled, electronics, etc. You open the door by pressing buttons, etc. And when we get there, the um, electricity, the hooded maintainer of the system, created these plugs with this, uh, this is a zoom, or the first or the third one, uh, with this wonderful icon there. Uh, I don't know if you see them, but uh, in the first case here, you have two buttons, one on the left and one on the right, and you have two pictures here. Then you have this alien with a um, lamp here, and then you have other two pictures with other two buttons, left and right. What this does? You are in a home, but not a strange environment. With door, windows, lights, what they do? The first one to you. I can describe the picture. It's a home with uh, a door that is almost open, and the other one is th the same home, the same house picture with the door that is almost closed. And you have a button. And they were like, you know, here, in this wall. There is a door here, there is a door there, there are windows there, there is a light. You put it, these things here, in line. And all these doors were controlled, so you cannot open the door. With your hand, you have to, to, pr to push the right button, which is the right button. Any guess? What they do? They open a door, they open a window. What they do? N and which one you use to open the door? The, the one on the left, the one on the right? Why? And are you sure? You can. <laughs> no, we cannot test it. Um, because you say it's slightly open, and so it's, it's to open more. Because it's on the left. But so two things. Uh, one may be, I don't remember actually. Uh, but you have to think about it. You have to interpret the icon. And then if, I, if it is, is here in this wall, and I ask you which door is open, this one or that one? Good luck. No, there is not another one there. There is just one here for the entire room. So that is very nice. Um, so th that opened the door. I don't remember which one, open and close, but you have to think about it. So, okay, this is slightly open, so maybe it continues to open. But other people can say, no, this is open. So if I press it, it will close it because it's already open. So it's discussion. Um, so how it was solved, so the other one uh, with this sort of alien, I don't know what is this, with this lamp was a control for multiple lights. And this other here, what is to you? It's a square with a, um, a narrow on, on the left and the other is a square with a narrow on the, on the right split in the half. What can be? It's a sliding door, and which one open, which one close, we can do the same discussion as before. And which door? Because again, we have more than one door. So how they, they, how they discover to you? How they discover it? They press all the button and see what happens. Yeah. And since they don't remember, so this was a house built for people that get accident, car accident, and needs support for living for a period. So we are on the wheelchair, and they cannot move autonomously. So this home was all uh, a smart home to help them. And there was a bed that they were moving electronically, so everything was. So it's not that I learned because it's my house, and then uh, I, I know and I remember. But they also have people that go around. So what they do? What they did for communicating the right icon for the right place, for the right door, for instance. It's, it's there in the picture. What they did? 
they take a piece of strip and they type, they type the, this piece of paper and they write what the button does. Like, oh, this is the door on the left, or the entrance door. And this other is for opening and closing the entrance door. They put a piece of paper. This is a problem of articulation. Find the right switch that opens the right door that you want. So you have a goal, open the door. You have a task, press a button. Which button? And so since the system, the system worked. There is no problem working, but the user interface, in this case, is the button and the icons could be improved. And since they cannot improve it, they put a piece of paper that say, don't look at the pictures. Just read here, and if it's, you want to open, press this. Don't make me think, it's the title of this book, but also uh, a good rule. When you have to think more than one second on the user interface, there is something wrong. Uh, problem presentation, do you know this? You know this? Now this is the advanced style selector in the world. Um, so let's focus on the last part, because the upper part is fine. The last part, effects. Here we have a problem of presentation. So imagine you don't know English. It's, there is a square and there, there is random letter that you don't know what it what means. Uh, which is the meaning of this list of squares in a user interface? What you can do when you have the, those in a user interface? You can select one or, or more. This is multiple selection, right? You can select the first, the second, the third, the fourth. If you don't understand, you expect the date to behave in this way. For all the seven, uh, but they don't in this case. You cannot have a sentence that is contemporary, superscript, and subscript. Cannot, they are mutually exclusive, the last two. And similarly, you cannot have a single strikeout on a word and a double strikeout on the word. Or a, either it's single or it's double. It cannot be both. And also here, or it's small caps or it's all caps. It cannot be all caps and contemporary small caps. So this is a problem of presentation. They could have organize this in a slightly different way. They work, again, if you click on sing, a strike out, and then you click on double strike out, the previous one, the select, and the second one is selected. So they work as intended. But if you never see this, and you don't know, you can try to select every, everything, and then you say, no, why is not working? That is for multiple selection. Why is not working for multiple selection? And actually, it is because you can do streak out, superscript, and small caps. So it is multiple selection overall, but not at pairs. This would need a redesign of that part of interface. Only that part, not everything else. And this is Microsoft Word, not the application made by three people yesterday. So even those products as this, and it's generally well done under this perspective, but they still have some um, nice thing that allow us to put them in the slides. And all of these we apply to, in general, but all of these is uh, clearly can be applied to major user interface style. It could be command line interface, interface could be menus, could be natural language, could be mobile, touch screen, uh, WIMP, virtual reality interface, all of these, the group execution and evaluation, is something that we can apply to all the uh, major styles. Okay, before doing the break, let me finish with, quickly with this. Um, so we have, in human group interaction, a few processes. Uh, some more old, some more modern, some more easy to use from novices, other more complex. So one of the oldest 
but still use his process for design is the user-centered design that is demonstrated that in, in case of software project, it avoid the risk of a software project failure uh, in, in term of improve 50% of the errors that you can have, so not, not a few. And the user-centered design takes the needs, the wants, the limitation of the current end user and try to, to consider that in each phase of the design process. Each phase, from understanding to prototyping, etc. The problem is that in each phase with the human cent user centered design, you have to involve user. So you do a first prototype, user. You do a second prototype, user. You make a decision, you have to involve users. So you can understand that maybe it works for a course, but in, let's say, in a company, this is a huge waste of time because in every step you have to include uh, users. So it works, it has benefits, but has also drawback. And how many users? Is three enough? Is 10? 100 every single time? Different from one, one time to the other? So this is a process, this has benefit, but required a lot of effort to be, uh, to be used. And it's, on the other side, it's quite simple to, to be used. Uh, participatory design and one step farther, uh, in which you don't involve a user after you do things, but you co-design with user. So you are in the same room with users and you design together with them. You make a decision together with them. This is widely used, for instance, for teaching, education, learning, because you speak with the domain expert. You don't only speak with the domain expert, you have the teacher designing with you something that you use for teaching. Uh, and with a series of methods, this is more, let's say, uh, this is more sophisticated, the user-centered design, but need to have a certain expertise from, the, from your perspective as a designer or as a researcher that wants to understand what to do, how to design, because you have to always keep in mind that you are the designers, the creators, the developers, they are the users. So even when you co-design, you have to interpret their wants and their needs and their design to put together something that then is doable because they don't have the technical knowledge or the expertise to do that. They know well their part and you should know well your part. So the balance between the two this two um, figure is something complex, it's not something that day one, let's do participatory design. Day one, let's do user-centered design that is easier, less risk in the sense of errors. Uh, then there is agile interaction design that is a mix between the agile family of methods and inserting human center, inserting human computer interaction in the process. Uh, so the, the key idea is that it's an evolutionary development as in the agile framework. So you have rapid release cycle, strips of one, two weeks in which you do design, etc., and then you iterate again, you iterate again, very quick uh, release cycle and, and require fast usability inspection, fast methods, because you cannot stay three months for understanding user needs because your cycle lasts one week. So in that week, you have to do everything. And then maybe you have to redo that or to change that in another week. But it's applying this in the agile methods. Um, that is already a methodology. And this, this is fine because maybe a company already has processes in place and you want to insert human computer interaction within the project the process they already have not to destroy the process the process that they have they're working uh, then there is design thinking that is let's say more popular nowadays together with service design um, and design thinking is again iterative process prototype based user center based as every other processes we have seen uh, but differently they also do two things that are different from the others. Uh, one is emphasize 
they put effort in understanding emotions in the process to empathize with the people, not just getting the people as a source of data, but also empathizing with them. And also in the IDET phase, that is the third one, they try to create ideas and to challenge existing assumptions. So to create something that is disruptive in a way. And this is five stages, and as you see in the picture, these five stages, you can go from empathize to define, and then to empathize to prototype, and then from prototype to ideate, they can be used in iterative way, but in various way. Uh, service design is, we can say that it's an extension design thinking, uh, found on five key principles, again, user-centered, uh, evidencing, etc. So the base things are common among all of these, uh, but they focus more, this, this design system, this design process focuses more on services, not product. So a product, for instance, like reported here, is a car. A car of a specific brand is a product, something you buy and use it. A service is seeing the car as a tool for an elderly pe person that want to, to, to take a Uber rider to visit a friend. The full experience, not just the object, not just the product, but what, how use the product in a larger context and put together business needs between the other things. And all of these, and now we are going to do a, a break, all of these are specific sys processes, specific framework that we are not going to apply specifically, none of them, but they share a lot of methods. That is what we are going to, to see. They share a lot of basic ideas, being user-centered, prototype, evaluate, design, prototype and evaluate in an iterative way with a user-centered perspective in various way with the same methods shared. And you can do an interview in the user-centered design, but you can also do an interview in the service design. It's the same method that we are going to, to see and we're going to use. And some of them are more specific to some domain. If you have a product, maybe service design is something that you don't really want to, to approach, even if nowadays everything is almost everything a service. But still, they have some particular characteristics some are more recent, some others are less, some needs more experience, some are the others. So we try to extract the main things and we try to uh, use a more, let's say, general, generalistic, uh, less opinionated design process that we are going to use in the course and especially tell you all the methods that are needed in this and in all the other processes that I've just listed to you. And now we can do a 20 minutes break.